Raising a daughter is a scary deal. What does she need from me? What does she need from us? How will God help us shape her into the godly young woman he wants her to be? We just feel so inadequate. Is there any hope that we can get this right? Now, I've been in this series of messages called Home Hope, and this morning I'm going to change gears just a little bit. And For the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the good news we find in God's Word for parenting, for parenting. How many of us need good news for raising kids? And uh, we never stop being burdened and concerned about our children, even when they gr are grown and have their own kids. And today specifically, I want to remind us of what needs to happen, what our girls need most. And here on the pages of the book of Ruth, we see this woman's life unfolding. But what we see happening is that she comes to a place where she, Ruth, takes her place in, in the middle of God's great purposes in her generation. She didn't know it at the time how God was going to use her. And, uh, and so today I want us to see from Ruth's life what our girls need most to take their place in God's great glorious purposes. Now, there are four chapters to the book of Ruth, four chapters to the life of Ruth. We begin in chapter, chapter 1, where we first meet Ruth as she is living with her mother-in-law, a woman by the name of Naomi. They have both experienced a tragic loss. Both of them have their husbands die and leave them alone. Now, we know that Naomi is a uh, an elderly Jewish woman, and so she decides that she's going to return back to her hometown of Bethlehem uh, in, in Judea. Uh, Ruth, on the other hand, has grown up in Moab, but she is so attached to Naomi that she decides that she is going to go home. She's going to go back with Naomi, and Naomi tries to discourage her, and, though we, and so we have these words found in Romans chapter, uh, Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, when Ruth replies to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And, uh, and, and may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death ever separates you and me. How many of you have ever heard that text read at a wedding? Uh, I, for years, I've, I've heard preachers use this text, but actually it was not about a husband and wife here. It's about a, a woman making a commitment to, to her mother-in-law. And so um, what we have here is Naomi and Ruth, chapter 2. We come to chapter 2. They're making this long journey back to, uh, back to Judea. And they arrive there just in time for the barley harvest. And this is where Ruth's story becomes a love story. And, uh, and so Ruth immediately has the challenge of providing food for, for herself and for Naomi. And so she goes into a field to uh, gather some grain. In those days, there was a law called the Law of Gleaning where uh, harvesters were to leave some grain lying in the field so that the poor and hungry could come along behind and pick up grain and feed themselves. And so this is what Ruth does. Chapter 2, verse 3 says she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So in the wonderful providence of God, Ruth has ended up in the field of uh, a man who is uh, actually a relative of Naomi. And uh, a man who has the possibility of helping Ruth in a way that she really needed. Now, Boaz notices Ruth, and it seems to be love at first sight. He notices her and recognizes that she is a woman that uh, has, has gained a reputation for being kind to Naomi. And so he senses that there's something special about this young lady. So we come to chapter 3. Now, Boaz is a man who has the means to deliver Ruth. Remember, he is a relative of Naomi, and therefore, he is what is called the kinsman redeemer. 
Ruth is in a very precarious situation. She has no husband. She has no children. She has no means of support. And she is in, is in terrible trouble if there's not someone who can take her under his wing and uh, be a husband to her and to rescue her. And Boaz is the man who can do it. He is her kinsman redeemer. But Ruth then does something surprising. She breaks all convention and all protocol when she proposes marriage to Boaz. And, uh, and so we see how Boaz responds to this. It's a very gracious response. Chapter 3, verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. And although it is true that I am a near, kin, a near of kin, here there is a kinsman, redeemer, nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. So we come to chapter 4, and Ruth and Boaz are married and as they say, they lived happily ever after. It was literally a marriage made in heaven. Look at chapter 4 and verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And so we see this amazing heartwarming story. Uh, the, the women in my family, the girls in my family, are great fans of uh, American Girl dolls. Are you familiar with American Girl dolls? If you have kids or grandkids, um, and uh, it is it's, it's very very popular. And uh, both of my granddaughters have American Girl dolls, and every year at Christmas or on their birthday. They make a trek over to the American Girl doll store in Dallas. It's a big thing. They can they have a tea party, and, and it's, it's, it's great fun. Unfortunately, I've had the misfortune of being on a number of those excursions to the American Girl store. And as a result of that, I know way more than a male ought to know about American Girl dolls. Well, this is one thing I have learned, and that is that that when, when you buy an American Girl doll, you're not just buying a doll, you are buying a story. Every doll comes with a story. Now, for instance, Caroline, uh, her doll is named Caroline also. Caroline Abbott is this girl, and uh, she lived in 1812. Her story is that her father was captured by the British in the War of 1812, and so she has all these grand adventures trying to find her father, and that's the story. And so with the story also comes plenty of accessories that mom and dad and grandparents get to buy along with it. And as I say, I, 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 I know way more than a male ought to know about American Girl dolls. But I was thinking about that when we, when we think about our girls and how they need to discover their story. That is the story that God has written for them. They need to learn how to live out God's great purpose for their lives. And that is our responsibility as parents and as grandparents to help them do that. Now, Ruth became a woman that God used in his glorious redemptive purposes in history. Because you come to the end of the book of Ruth and you see that the generations after her are listed. So Ruth and Boaz get married. They have a son by the name of Obed. Obed has a son by the name of Jesse. And Jesse becomes the father of one of the most important figures in God's redemptive work in, in, in history. A man by the name of David. Little does Naomi, uh, Ruth know that she will become the great grandmother of David and the great great grandmother of Solomon, the two most important kings in Israel's history. But it doesn't end there because you go into the New Testament and you come to Matthew chapter 1 and you find the genealogy of Jesus, the ancient version of Ancestry.com. And there you see the family tree of Jesus. And, and sure enough, right there in the middle 
is Ruth listed as the great-grandmother of, of David. And 28 generations later, there is Jesus, born to Mary, whose husband is Joseph. And so in this wonderful family tree of Jesus, one of the most important branches is this woman named Ruth, who has found her place and God's great purposes in her world. Little did she know that when she traveled back with Naomi to the little town of Bethlehem, that 1,200 years later, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would be born in that same little town of Bethlehem. And so, what does it take for a girl to grow to understand her place in God's kingdom's work, even if at the time she has no idea what that will become. Well, I wanted to show you a few things that I think are impo important for, for parents to instill in their daughters, for us as grandparents to help instill in our, our granddaughters. And the first thing is the importance of, of godly people, the influence of godly people. Ruth was raised in a pagan land by pagan parents. But God brought Naomi into her life, and as a result of that, it changed the whole direction of her life. That Ruth became a follower of God due to the influence of her mother-in-law. And how important it is that, that our girls, that our granddaughters, have this godly influence of parents and grandparents and teachers and other leaders who will be there to encourage them and to help them to find all the way through Ruth's life. You see Naomi there in the picture, giving her wise counsel and helping her to make good decisions. And oh, how important that is. And I look out across this crowd and I see a lot of gray hairs like mine and, and I'm reminded of how important it is for us as grandparents to be and provide that kind of godly influence for our little girls. I mean, it really does take a family to do this. And, uh, and, and so the importance of the influence of godly people. But there's something else that our girls need, and that is trust in and obedience to God. Trust in and obedience to God. You see, when we first meet Ruth, she has, she has spent her whole life worshiping pagan idols. And then she meets Naomi and comes to understand that, that there is a God in Israel who is, who is the one true God. And, and somewhere along the way, she realizes that she needs a relationship with him. In fact, this is one thing that Boaz recognizes about Ruth that attracts him to her. That she has become a believer. She has put her trust in God. Chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz says, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You see, one of the things that attracted Boaz to her was her devotion to God. And that's so important. She had become like a little bird that had flown under the protective cover of the wings of its parents. And, and our little girls ultimately must make the same decision. And we fail miserably if we fail to pass our faith to the next generation. And that's what keeps us on our knees and keeps us living before our kids and our grandkids. The life of God, the life of following and depending upon and obeying and serving God. But there's something else girls need, and that is to find, uh, to find their place in God's purpose, and that is upright character. Upright character. Now, as you read Ruth's story, you see that she wasn't afraid to work. She was, I get the impression she's a strong woman, but, but her strength is not, not simply physical strength. It is, it is strength of character. In fact, we see that, and again, this is what attracts Boaz to Ruth, for it says there in chapter 3 in verse 11, he says, all my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. You're a woman of noble character. You see, 
the way you live your life determines the kind of people that you attract. And so we need to say to our young ladies, as you live a godly life, you will attract godly people. You will be attractive to godly people. And, uh, and this is what happened for Ruth. But what does this noble character mean? What does this look like? Well, there's some things that, that I see in Ruth's story here. First of all, I think it means moral purity. Moral purity. In fact, verse 11 in the New American Standard Bible says that Ruth is a woman of excellence. A woman of excellence. Moral excellence. Purity. And from the earliest days of their lives... Girls need to be taught the importance of that purity that they maintain before the Lord. But then I see also that there is the, 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 the character of faithfulness. The character of faithfulness. You see, when Boaz sees Ruth in that, in that crowded field, he has already learned of her reputation of faithfulness and of love. In fact, he says in, Rome, it says in Ruth 2.11, Boaz replied, I've been, I, I've been told all about, uh, about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. So her faithfulness and loyalty to her mother-in-law has, has become a matter of her reputation. And so this is the kind of love and faithfulness that Ruth has developed that she's going to bring into her relationship with her husband. And for our girls, it's never too early to teach them that quality. But then I also see this noble character in the quality of humility. Humility. Think about Ruth marching into that field to begin to pick up grain. She wasn't afraid to do the humble work of harvesting, of picking up grain. And certainly that is a quality that, that needs to be instilled in our girls from the earliest age to be, to be humble. But then there's another quality, the quality of courage. The quality of courage. I, I'm impressed with the courage that it took for Ruth to, to leave her, her family and to leave her homeland and to leave the pagan culture that she had grown up in to follow Naomi to, to Israel how we need to model that kind of courage for our girls, for our kids, that they will see in us the courage to obey God no matter what the cost and that that would be conveyed to them. Now, the gospel tells us that this moral purity and this faithfulness and this this humility and courage and all of these other qualities of noble character are not things that we can do in and of ourselves, in our own strength. In fact, Jesus had to come and live and die and be raised from the dead because we couldn't be pure and because we couldn't be faithful, because we couldn't be humble and courageous and all the other things. Jesus Christ died so that we could become all those things as he gives us a new nature. But there's one more thing I want us to see about Ruth's life and what, what our, our girls need in order to take their place in God's great purposes in their world. And that is, and this is going to sound strange, a right relationship with men. A right relationship with men. Now I want to be careful here because a woman's value and worth in the eyes of God and her place in the purposes of God has nothing to do with whether she's married or not or what men think of her. But how she relates to men, how she learns to relate to men is very important. You see, if Ruth had just gone after, like Boaz said, you didn't go after the youngest guy whether he was rich or poor. Rather, Ruth waited for God to bring the right man into her life. If she had gone after another man who was not God's man for her, she would have missed being a part of the great things that God did through her, through Boaz and their son Obed and Jesse and David and the Lord Jesus Christ. She would have missed that. She had not waited for God to bring the right man into her life. And it's this, it's this that 
that, that allowed her to find a husband who loved her unconditionally. Now, this is so important for our daughters. Before they run into the arms of a man, they need to first run into the arms of God. Let me say that again. Before they run to the arms of a man, they need to first run to the arms of God. You see, this is what what Boaz noticed about Ruth. He says there in chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So she had first, first run to the arms of God. But then notice what happens as, uh, as, as this unfolds because when it comes time for, for Ruth to commit herself to a man, notice how it is described as Boaz and the field workers laid down to sleep for, for the night. Ruth went over and lay down at the feet of Boaz. And you remember the story, Boaz wakes up and he sees this woman lying at his feet. And he says in Ruth 3 in verse 9, Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are my kinsman redeemer. Now that phrase, spread your, the corner of your garment over me, literally is spread your wings over me. It's the very same word that was used to describe Ruth running to the arms of God and finding protection under the wings of God. There again, they have to run to God before they run to a man. And when a woman gets those things mixed up, there's so much heartache in her life. If she runs to a man to fill her life with meaning, then it will, her life will be filled with heartache. But when she learns first to find her well-being and her worth in, the, in a relationship with the Lord God, then when she runs into the arms of a man, she knows that God has provided this man to love her unconditionally. And girls like that grow into young women whom God will use in his great glorious purposes in this world. That's what I long for my daughters and my, my grandkids. I want them to find their place in God's great purposes. I don't want them, I don't want them to live most of their life not knowing what that is and, and, and not being a part of what God is doing in this world. Some of you may have heard of the great revival in 1904 and 1905 that swept across the nation of Wales. And, uh, it, and it, it uh, ultimately would, would shake not only Wales, but Great Britain and Europe, and even spread across the Atlantic here to the United States. And there were many pastors and preachers and evangelists who were involved in that great movement of God. And, and they were involved in, in spreading the wildfire revival, but Church historians tell us that it was probably sparked one Sunday night in a small little chapel where some believers were meeting in Wales. And there was a young teenage girl by the name of Flory Evans who stood up in the midst of a prayer service. And she, with passion in her voice, said, Oh, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. And historians tell us that the Spirit of God took that simple testimony of a young girl and it set that church on fire and it spread to the community. And then it began to spread to the outlying areas and to other towns and communities and cities. And it spread all over Wales and to Great Britain and Europe and ultimately here to the United States. But it all started with just one little girl who stood up and said, Oh, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. All oh, that God would give us young ladies like that. And we as parents and grandparents and as a church have the opportunity to help them get this equipment and to help them gain what they need most.
to take their place in God's kingdom. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you are moving and working. And thank you that you invite us to be a part of what you're doing. And our greatest longing, God, for the next generation is for the faith to be passed to them and that they would find their place in your kingdom's work. They would find your place in the glorious, redemptive purposes of God in their generation. And Lord, so help us to be the cheerleaders and the coaches and the encouragers for the next generation of young women and men. In Jesus' name.